Good afternoon. I wanted to thank um, ILAR, in particular Lita, um, and everyone at the National Academy of Sciences for inviting me to be here today uh, and to celebrate the 60th anniversary of ILAR. I am truly honored to have been asked uh, to provide my perspective. And uh, there are so many outstanding achievements uh, of ILAR that we could be here for hours. So I, I have selected some things that I think either struck home with me or just really resonate with um, how ILAR was instrumental in advancing uh, how we look at animals, how we care for animals, and how we use animals successfully in science. So that's going to be my focus today. This presentation is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Thomas Wolfley. Uh, and I'm going to probably start to cry here. Um, uh, Tom was a consummate historian. And everything that you're going to see today is, is taken one way or the other from the material that he has presented on multiple occasions about um, the history of laboratory animal science and in particular the history about ILAR. And uh, as you all probably know, uh, Tom was the director from 1988 to 1997 um, of ILAR. Uh, I was very fortunate enough in early in my career as a very junior commission corps officer in the public health service uh, to work with Tom at the NIH. Uh, one of my fond memories of him uh, is how well he was at staying organized in spite of his very busy schedule and the incredibly important activities that he was involved in at that time in the 1980s. And if you all aren't remembering, the mid-1980s to late 1980s was when we had major changes in uh, animal welfare regulations here in the United States and also how NIH required institutions to have animal care and use committees. So. Uh, he was in the thick of all that. So anyway, um, he was one of the first people I knew who effectively used yellow sticky notes. <laughs> and I shared uh, the office suite with Tom for a period of time when I first came to NIH before I got my, my first assignment. And if you walked in Tom's office, you would see yellow sticky notes in certain places on his desk. You would see yellow sticky notes on the wall so that as he was walking out the door, and it was his way of prioritizing every different thing that was going on. And as I said, it, it, I still have this memory of that and how it actually influenced me too as an individual in staying organized in spite of all of the, the craziness that often goes on in our lives. So thank you, Tom. I will hopefully be channeling him in one way or the another th throughout the rest of this presentation. And I do have uh, two of his key references at the end um, to acknowledge the contributions that he did make. So I'm going to uh, take off where Barbara uh, gave some of the history and focus a little bit on the starting point for ILAR and the founding of ILAR. And I thought the best way to do that is to actually remind us all of where we were back in 1953. So I went to Wikipedia, and they have an awesome uh, little uh, product where you can click on a year and see what was going on both in the world and in US history and in different aspects of, of, of how we are operating uh, here in the world. So US history in 1953, the ones that I picked out, Dwight Eisenhower succeeded Harry Truman as president. The first Chevy Corvette was built at Flint, Michigan. The Korean War ended. The United States tested the hydrogen bomb. And Hugh Hefner published the first issue of Playboy magazine. Uh, it sold over 54,000 copies at the cost of 50 cents each. And I'm going to give away a secret here. It was also the year that I was born in a Midwestern town uh, name of Columbus, Ohio. So in science and medicine, where were we? 
uh, very significant events occurred in 1953. Watson and Crick published the molecular structure of DNA. Jonas Salk announced his polio vaccine. And for the animal lovers, B.F. Skinner published the book Science and Human Behavior that focused on how animal behavior could also reflect on human behavior in some aspects. Very controversial at the time, of course. So now I'm going to continue with the history story uh, by focusing on ILAR's current mission. And, and Barbara shared that with you all. And I'm going to uh, expand on it in certain places and show you examples where I think there's been significant achievement by ILAR throughout its history in um, and continuing this mission from the beginning to the present time. So the first uh, ILAR mission um, element is to evaluate and report on scientific, technological, and ethical use of animals and related biological resources and of non-animal alternatives in non-food settings, such as research, testing, education, and production of pharmaceuticals. So as we heard, uh, in 1956, the first report from ILAR had to do with parasitic and infectious diseases of laboratory animals. So after World War II, there was increased attention being devoted to medicine, and the key players were all congregated in a few research institutions in Chicago, and that was this famous Chicago Five. Notably, Nate Brewer from the University of Chicago, Bennett Cohen from Northwestern University at the time, and Robert J. Flynn at the Argonne National Laboratory. They formed an organization called the Animal Care Panel, which began meeting annually in 1952, and also publishing the proceedings of their meetings. The Animal Care Panel became what we know today as ALAS, the American Association for Laboratory Animal Science. I think I missed a slide. I did miss a slide. I'm sorry. This is where we should be. So a colleague of Nate Brewer's at the University of Chicago, Paul Weiss, was also the chairman of the National Research Council's Division of Biology and Agriculture. And Weiss was a renowned embryologist at the time and also familiar with the special needs of laboratory animals. He was convinced that more could be done and convened a conference in 1952 on annual animal procurements. That uh, particular conference was led by Clarence Cook Little, who was a uh, very well-known geneticist and also was the founder of the Jackson Memorial Laboratory. And for us mice people, we all know what Jackson Labs is, was then and is today. Very, very important. So the result of that conference was to request that the National Research Council establish a committee on animal resources. And the purpose was to, um, for recommending a long-term procurement and supply mechanism of animals for biological, medical, and agricultural research. The conference report specifically charged that the Council on Animal Resources, or Committee on Animal Resources, take advantage of the expertise of existing organizations and individuals and seek implementation of their recommendations by the National Research Council. So in 1952, the committee recommended formation of the Institute of Animal Resources within the National Research Council. And in July 1953, it was established in the Division of Biology and Agriculture, which of course is where Paul Weiss was located. So as we've heard, ILAR's mission continued uh, starting in 1952 and 53, and that first report two years later from the Institute of Animal Resources was um, uh, established based on a subcommittee on health standards. And they appointed, interestingly enough, Nate Brewer to be the Parasitism Committee Chair. He was also serving that time as the Institute of Animal Resources Scientific Advisory Council. And that committee pr produced that first report on parasitic infectious diseases. The report provided a first comprehensive information relative to infections and infestations of laboratory animals, 
to the end that diseases of laboratory animals may be effectively controlled. That's a quote from uh, the report itself. It also called for a system of accreditation and certification of laboratory breeders and for the elimination of certain diseases in animal colonies in order for accreditation and certification to succeed. So uh, we, ha we had the infancy of the accreditation idea way back in 1956, long before the Animal Welfare Act had been passed or NIH was even thinking about um, animal care and use in animal facilities. In 1956, when the diseases report was released, the National Cancer Institute took note. Uh, their Cancer Chemotherapy National Service Center chose to contract specifically with the renamed Institute of Laboratory Animal Resources to develop minimum standards for the commercial production of random, random bred mice and inbred mice. They had a conference on animal standardization and accreditation that was chaired by T.C. Byerly, who was um, chairman of the Institute of Animal Resources at the time. Um, and they also asked for uh, the development of standards. Uh, many of the standards that were developed in the succeeding years uh, have gone on to become standards that continue to this day to provide the framework for how we look at caring for animals and how we also look at how animals are maintained um, in a breeding production um, environment. Some other key things that happened back in the 50s, they also demonstrate the expanded development of ILR's mission um, as the years progressed. Uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned this, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail. In December 50, 1956, ILR joined with a number of other uh, organizations. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, the International Union of Biological Sciences, and the Committee on International Organization of Medical Scion Sciences, SIOMS, and also with representatives from organizations in Great Britain and France to discuss inter international transport, the supply and quality of laboratory animals. As we heard today, um, a continuing issue uh, is the transportation of animals, and it was one way back when then, too. This International Committee on Laboratory Animals was established, and ILAR appointed a representative from the United States. This ICLA, International Committee on Laboratory Animals, was conceived as a non-governmental organization to promote high standards of laboratory animal quality, care, and health. In 1979, it was changed to the International Council of Laboratory Animal Sciences, ICLIS, and ILAR continues to serve as the U.S. representative to ICLIS, and the international efforts of ICLIS seek to harmonize policies in order to facilitate the exchange of biological materials, the exchange of animals used in research, and for marketing of biologicals and pharmaceuticals derived from their use. Throughout the 1950s, ILR developed a reputation as a source of information for locating unique laboratory animals. And this information was also uh, uh, developed into what became the first quarterly newsletter published by, the informa uh, by ILR. It was called the Information on Laboratory Animals for Research. Um, and in 1957 was the first issue that it was published. It surveyed, uh, also provided surveys that resulted in publications of lists of commercial sources of laboratory animals that became published on a regular basis, and that was called the Animals for Research publication. That was uh, during my early career. That was the go-to uh, publication if you were trying to find some exotic species or some specialized genetic stock or strain of animals was to go to the Animals for Research book. But of course, as technology advanced, so did ILAR, and uh, this was um, transported into a database. Uh, it's now part and parcel of our ongoing ability here in the U.S. and across the world to identify and find um, uh, particular animal strains, stocks, or genetically manipulated animals. 
and the International Laboratory Code Registry retains um, its place here at ILAR and, as I said, is, is um, continued to be a major source for um, sharing information about uh, the animals available for biomedical research. A third example of ILAR's expanding and vital role in advancing laboratory animal sciences was the first of three meetings held at, towards the end of the 1950s. These were led by ILAR, but also included the Lobund Institute in Indiana, the NIH, and the Office of Naval Research. They were um, brought together to show the individual scientist how he, he can adapt current techniques in germ-free technology to his own investigations. They uh, became known as the Notobiotic Workshops and were convened by ILAR annually for a number of years and included representatives from the commercial rat and mouse breeders. They demonstrated in the beginning such um, concepts as the, as the construction of flex flexible film isolators, cesarean section derivation of germ-free animals, detection of microbial contamination, and the effect of microbial can contamination upon the health of animals, and also methods to ship germ-free animals. So this was really another example where ILAR just stepped up and took on something that was unique and the need was there. And I'm hoping that that will continue um, as I reflect on other aspects of what ILAR does. So the next mission item um, on ILAR's list is to identify practices that provide for excellence in the welfare of animals used for these purposes and recognize their moral value while achieving high quality science. And the paramount, exam paramount example of this accomplishment is the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. And as you can guess, um, it um, has a very special place in my heart because as a, um, the director of OLA, NIH, um, and public health service agencies, it's my responsibility to ensure that institutions receiving funds to conduct research with animals follow the, the current edition of the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. But it was just an idea back in the 1960s. So it came about, as, as you can guess, to address the need that there was uh, continued to be in the 1960s by both investigators and animal colony managers to better define the parameters of animal care and use. Dr. Ben Cohen, and someone that um, you need to think, remember the name. He's going to play a, a key role throughout uh, the history of, of animal care and use in the U.S. He had been elected chair, chairman of ILAR in 1962, but he was also chairman of the animal care panel. So he was wearing multiple stats, uh, hats, and the, in particular, the Standards for Laboratory Animal Committee. So he became the chair of the authoring committee for the guide. Well, the 1963 guide uh, um, was published by the Animal Care Panel under a contract from the Division of Research Resources at NIH. They did incorporate, ILAR was involved with this, and I will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. OLA happens to have in our historical records a copy of the application that Ben Cohen and company submitted to NIH requesting funds to um, uh, develop and publish that first guide. So I'm going to show you some of these, um, share with you some of the information from these. So this is the PHS 398. Uh, this is the top page of that document, of that application. And you can see I've highlighted the amount requested. $14,520. And I'm going to share with you in a minute the actual budget that was shared that was part of the application because just like grant applications today, they did have to itemize some of the, the parts of their, of their proposed budget. And you can see the period date was they only wanted the money and they were going to get the work done in a year, which is commendable. Um, ben Cohen was the PI. Uh, the institution was the animal care panel. Incorporated, located in Argonne, Illinois. And you can see the list of principal invest other co-principal investigators. 
these were all luminaries in laboratory animal science at the time, veterinari many of them the veterinarians that were part of that Chicago Five and others that also had become um, very active in trying to promote the, the best for the animals. Okay, so now we're going we're gonna to move on to other parts of that th uh, PHS 398. On the first page was a summary of the proposed work and they were limited to 200 words or less back then. Okay, and here's an ex excerpt and I'm, I think it succinctly describes the role being played, including ILARs. This project would establish appropriate professional standards for laboratory animal, animal facilities and care. Progress in laboratory animal care in recent years is due in large measure to the effective work of the national organizations in this field, the Animal Care Panel, the Institute of Laboratory Animal Resources, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Board of Laboratory Animal Medicine and to the interests of the scientific community generally in providing adequately for the laboratory species. So again, they didn't take total credit for the idea. They wanted to also say that the scientists are on board with this concept. Okay. The significance of the research was another part of the application which continues to this day. So I've also excerpted parts of the application. To, to again highlight um, what they were seeing at that time and what I would say continues today as to the importance of this, um, this document and uh, its uh, continued publication. This project is significant because for the first time representatives of the scientific community in the United States who are specialists in the field of laboratory animal care will meet and formally develop professionally acceptable standards for the care and maintenance of laboratory animals. The proposed standards would establish an approved plan of procedure which would be given wide coverage and distribution throughout the scientific community and be freely available to all with an interest in animal care. I think it speaks for itself that they, they really looked at this as something they could um, share and um, promote and uh, really advance uh, the welfare of animals. That budget, pretty interesting stuff. Okay, that $14,000, 3200 was for personnel. That was for a, uh, hours for a secretary and hours for the animal care panel, panel ex executive manager, who I think was probably one of the, the organizers for the meetings that they had to, um, to uh, bringing the, the members of the committee together. They asked for equipment. They itemized a typewriter and they needed a $90 filing cabinet, okay? Consumable supplies, you can guess that was, you know, paper, postage, things like that. Travel, $5,200 to bring the, the full committee uh, for three meetings from all parts of the U.S. Uh, uh, you, can, you can just kind of put that in perspective on how much that would cost today. Um, other print, other uh, uh, costs, they were proposing $3,000 to print, print, and back then, of course, printing was the only way that you could distribute things. We couldn't, we couldn't put things up on a web page and share it with the world. And also, they had to mimeograph things. We don't even use that word anymore. <laughs> so, and then indirect costs, 1890, that went to the animal care panel just as part of any institution can request indirect uh, funds for, um, as part of a grant application. So that's where that $14,000 uh, went, and I think it was very well spent. And here's just a picture of some of the key players uh, back then. You can see Dr. Cohen is, is the second um, from the left, and Dr. Clarkson was also a member of that original committee. Several of the other individuals there were also quite influential as chairs of the ILR Council in the 1960s and 1970s. And Dr. Hopla on the left side was ILR director for a, a significant period of time during um, that part of ILR's history. So now, more about the guide. So they created this document way back when. What did, it, what did it do and how has it proceeded? And I need to find where I am on my notes here so I don't forget something. 
When you give a history talk, you're allowed to have notes so that you don't say something wrong. At least that's my crutch today. So subsequent to that initial uh, 1963 edition uh, from the Animal Care Panel, um, at the request of NIH, the guide was revised by ILR. ILR took over as the, the prime mover and shaker for, shaker for the document in 1965, 68, 78, 85, and 96. The Government Printing Office published all but the 1996 and the 2011 editions, and users were free to copy or translate it into other languages at that time as there was no copyright restrictions. The 1996 and 2011 editions were published by the National Academy Press, and ILAR has participated in supporting the translation of the guide in cooperation with ALAC and many other partners, and that continues to this day. And of course, that reflects the international interest in using the standards established here in the U.S. way back when, um, as they can be applied across the globe. So a review of the first guide reminds us of the changes made in the laboratory animal care field. The largest section was an extensive treatment of the physical plant, whereas, of course, the 2011 edition is uh, the largest chapter is about in the animal environment, housing, and management. So that really shows the, the direction, the transition that we've gone from an emphasis on engineering de details of the animal facility, the brick and mortar parts of the animal facility, to the performance goals and the focus on the animal and its environment. It really tells a story about the advancements in our understanding of animal welfare and how best to address the entire animal. Another mission element of ILAR is to evaluate and encourage the use, development, and validation of non-animal alternatives. And there are multiple examples of uh, how ILAR has involved from a very early time in, in encouraging, whenever possible, uh, the re reduction, replacement, and refinement in the use of animals, and in particular in non-animal alternatives. And I'm just going to highlight a few of these and from different eras here at, um, uh, in the history of ILAR. So here's an example um, from the 1980s, and this was in concert with the amendments to the Animal Welfare Act and also the interest by Congress at the time in alternatives to animal testing. And if you see the, the, uh, the item on the last, uh, um, the last item there on the front page of ILR News, uh, which was the publication that replaced the ILR newsletter, was the ILR News for a period of time. Um, ILR worked in cooperation with the National Library of Medicine uh, and began publishing annually annotated bibliographies that covered um, all of the uh, journal publications that had to do with alternatives to the use of live vertebrate animals in research and testing. And this was a um, a welcome uh, resource for the biomedical community who also were facing the re new requirement to have to address alternatives to animals in their an uh, research protocols. Um, this con continued for several more years after 1989. Uh, if, we, if we move on to 1997, uh, the ILR News had been ch uh, changed its name to the ILR Journal and they had a whole issue on the role of computational models in animal research. And here again, the idea was to provide information on alternatives and cover, it covered multiple topics related to the development of computer model systems that enhance or complement animal models. Another mission element of ILAR is to provide independent, objective advice to the federal government, to the international biomedical community, and to the public through reports of expert committees, the ILAR journal, web-based resources, and other means of communication. And of, this is going to be, of course, a very long list, but I'm going to just highlight a few again from, uh, from out, uh, throughout the history of ILAR. This is one of my favorite little 
documents that I have in my in my own collection and I pulled it out and took a look and it's still got some really good stuff in it so back in 1976 um, uh, going back further 1990 1966 was when uh, there was a first report about thymic aplasia in the new new mutant mouse and uh, that development allowed for significant advances in um, immunology, oncology, and also developmental biology. Well, uh, there was a lot of interest uh, across the research community in getting these animals. And you couldn't buy them, you had to breed them. So uh, ILAR was one of the key movers and shakers in bringing together a committee and developing a report that was freely available to anybody who wanted to try and take on how to raise these very unique animals who didn't have a normal immune system and were subject to just about any kind of infection you can, you can guess from fungus to bacteria to virus um, and they would not survive very well. They were also very difficult to breed. So Ilar uh, published this report in 1976 how to care for them, how to produce them, how to transport them. Because even if you were taking them from your nice little flexible film isolator to the lab, you were potentially um, going to be causing problems for the animals, and let alone if you had to bring them back. So uh, a lot of information needed to be shared. It was an invaluable resource, and as I said, I, I covet it to this day as something that I think um, is, is really a, a valuable um, precedence was set way back when as to how to manage these very special creatures and give them the best and maintain them for much longer. At the, at the time when they first uh, were produced, many um, institutions were only able to keep them alive for a few months to maybe a year, but they were able to, uh, through the development of special techniques, to maintain them for a full, the full normal mouse um, life cycle. Another example, I mentioned the idea that ILAR started out um, very early on in its um, infancy in developing standards. And this is just another example where um, ILAR recognized a need and brought together a committee of experts and in 1997 um, published a, um, a particular publication on uh, the laboratory animal management of wild birds. As I said, this is just one example. You can, you can find um, throughout the ILAR history many, many other uh, standards on many different species. And for us, as I said, in early in my career, it was a ready resource uh, to, to find out just what, I, what was everybody else was doing for a particular species or group of, of animals. International aspects of ILAR's mission. Just one example, there are many examples of ILAR's role in um, trying to harmonize across the world the standards for the care and use of laboratory animals and how to share that information effectively. And in this case, they uh, brought together an international work workshop in 2008, um, uh, chaired and uh, by a uh, an in international uh, representative, but also with representation from across the U.S. of some very stellar individuals, all bringing together the concept of how can we uh, harmonize and move towards uh, a, a better standard that, that is easy for uh, all the countries to adopt. It was mentioned by uh, Barbara that uh, ILR also gets asked to do special reports, and this is at the behest of, sometimes at the behest directly of Congress, or sometimes Congress asks NIH, and then NIH turns to ILR. And here's an, uh, one of those specific examples. So Congress in particular, um, the uh, Senate and House Appropriations Committees were specifically interested in the um, uh, concerns raised by the public about the continued use of uh, Class B dogs and cats and research funded by NIH. And uh, the House and Senate um, Appropriations Committee reports of 2008 specifically charged NIH 
to determine the humane and scientific issues associated with the use of random source dogs and cats. So they turned to ILAR and a, um, a group of experts to develop a response to thoroughly look at the, at the situation and make recommendations that NIH could consider. Uh, the report was published in 2009 and in um, 2010, NIH announced that they were in transition to um, eliminate the use of random source dogs in NIH-funded research, and they have already, as of last year, um, ended uh, support for um, any studies that propose the use of cats from random source dealers. So that is a, um, an ongoing effort uh, in response to a particular uh, report and recommendations from ILAR. I'm going to switch a little bit to ILAR core values. Uh, there's a mission statement, but then there's a focused set of core values that I think also uh, are a good um, way to look at how ILAR has um, carried out its mission and continues to carry out its mission in this last 60 years. So the first core value, support the responsible use of animals in research, testing, and education as a key component to advancing the health and quality of life and human animals. Back in the 1990s, we had had amendments um, to, uh, uh, well, we had amendments dating back to the late 1980s uh, uh, to uh, address requirements from the Animal Welfare Act regulations to address the psychological well-being of non-human primates. And I think it, it kind of was a watershed period where there was a lot of interest in it, but not a lot of published science. So it took a little bit of time, I think, for them to, uh, for the scientific community and the veterinary community to kind of wrap their, wrap their heads around how do we address this concept of psychological well-being. Uh, Eilar took the lead and um, developed, um, pulled together a, a stellar committee of people from across the, the laboratory animal um, arena, the zoo arena, just a multitude of individuals, also research scientists uh, um, doing research in um, behavioral research with, with non-human primates uh, to uh, support the development of this uh, expanded report on psychological well-being of non-human primates. It was sponsored by NIH and USDA. Um, so it was meant to, as I said, to assist institutions in developing their environmental enhancement plans, which was, as I said, a requirement of the new regulations. And also how to assess uh, primate psychological well-being in a variety of non-human primate genera. If you look at this, if you uh, pull out a copy of this book, or if you go online and look at it, it covers a multitude of genera, which is probably one of the few places where you can find that amount of information about all the primate species um, and how, how best to take care of them in a captive setting. Another hot topic issue that ILAR got involved in uh, back in uh, the 90s was, uh, again, uh, requested by uh, of ILR by NIH. It was in response to concerns by the American Antivivisection Society about the use of animals in the production of monoclonal antibodies. The committee was asked specifically to determine the scientific necessity for the method, whether it caused pain and distress, and what could be done to minimize pain and distress, and to comment on available in vitro methods. And this was, a, um, again, a, I think a watershed change in the scientific community's resistance to consider um, other ways of doing uh, monoclonal antibody production. And uh, this bo uh, volume by uh, ILAR in particular, I think, uh, is, to this day still has a lot of valuable information um, to consider. Well, ILAR's core second value is to promote high quality science and humane care and use of research animals based on the principles of refinement, replacement, and reduction, and high ethical standards. And again, I've covered some of these, but I'm just going to show you a few more of my, my special publications from ILAR that I think, again, are just invaluable. So 1992, 
Recognition and Alleviation of Pain and Distress in Laboratory Animals, a pivotal contribution. It expanded our understanding of how to minimize pain and distress in animals. It was uh, based on a um, recommendation um, starting in 1988 uh, uh, of a, a, a collection of advisors from across the federal government, uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and in general, the uh, scientific community on how do we address pain and distress, and in particular because of the amendments to the Animal Welfare Act and the need to, to really focus, I, help IACUCs understand better what is a painful procedure, what is a distressful procedure. And those are not only the requirements in the Animal Welfare Act, but also the Health Research Extension Act had specific language uh, requiring institutions to minimize pain and distress to animals um, in the course of research funded by uh, the federal government. So ILAR was encouraged to develop this guide, and in doing so, they define pain, they define stress, de-stress and well-being, and those definitions continue to this day to be very valuable as we look at um, this um, uh, very important concept. It was updated, but what they chose to do was, because there had been expanded scientific li literature on uh, the topic of distress, the decision was made by ILAR to form a, a committee focused on the topic of distress and provide a report on alleviation of distress in laboratory animals. And then to follow that with a second report with another focus group of experts in the uh, idea of alleviation of pain um, to provide a report on how we had um, learned more and can do more to minimize both pain and distress in laboratory animals. The third ILOR core value to foster best practices that enhance human and animal welfare by organizing and disseminating information and by facilitating dialogue among interested parties. And the two that I picked for this have to do with kind of the, the sidelight of what happens in an animal facility is how do you p protect the people? The animals are there. We, we, we've learned a lot on how to take care of them. But we also have to protect those people that are there working with those animals because they have their own risks um, going on when they're there handling animals, working with animals, and also the hazards that often go along with the research involved. So back in 1997, um, ILAR was asked to step up and um, into this new arena, and they created this seminal guidelines uh, and I, I would encourage you again to take a look at this book because there's still some awesome information in there that applies today. We're not, we're, when we have something good, we don't necessarily have to update it regularly um, if, if, it, if it, the uh, premise of it and the uh, recommendations of it still are, are effective, which in this case I believe they are. So it's not only focuses on animal facilities, but also the research labs where the animals are taken. They followed that in 2003, and that was, I think, primarily based on the success of the first book on just the general concept of occupational health in the animal facility, with a, a, a focused report on the care of um, uh, how to protect individuals who are involved in the care of non-human primates. And again, um, the idea to, that there are special hazards and that um, it's a unique and uh, special environment when you're dealing with, with animals who have the potential to transmit zoonotic diseases to us, but also the, the risk that we may actually be able to transmit zoonotic diseases to them, um, and, and how best to risk assess individuals depending on the individual activities that they're involved in when they're working with non-human primates. And I've now come to the end of my presentation, and um, again, I'd like to congratulate ILAR on its vision and dedication in supporting the effectively, so effectively, the laboratory animal science community in the last 60 years. This quote is borrowed from Dr. Charles McCarthy, who um, was the first uh, director of the Office for Protection from Research Risks, which is the the um, early organization that Ola uh, came from. He used it in a talk that he gave about the history of OPRR. 
And I think it captures very well the importance of looking back and honoring all of those individuals, all of those many committees and the many contributions that they made, the pivotal contributions that they made to bring us to where we are today. We are all standing on their shoulders. We all have that challenge to continue this um, in whatever capacity that we have. In particular, it's our colleagues like Nate Brewer, Ben Cohen, and Tom Wolfley, who we have to thank. Thank you very much. <laughs>